Okay, you ready, AP? Ready when you are. Let's lay this baby down. Lofty, you on the guitar, mate? You right, Scope? Yep, standing by. Bertie, you on the bass? Yep, ready to go. All right, here we go then. One, two, three, four. Just two good old boys. Two good old boys. Never meeting no harm. Before we never saw the hand, no hair since the day they was born. Straighten the curves. Straighten the curves. Flatten the heels. The coffee might get them, but the Lord never will. For casting away. Hey everybody and welcome back or welcome to the Mojo Radio Show Season 5. This is a little program designed to help you get your mojo working in and out of work. If you've got it, good. How do you keep it? If you've lost it, how do you get it back? And if you never had it, how do you get yourself some? Behind the console, the dulcet tones of Sir mix a we call him here in the studio, our production guru, Robbo. Great show again this week. Thank you. How are you going? Good. I am jacked up on my Fish River Roast this morning. Hello to Pete Harrison and all the team at Fish River Roast, keeping me fueled with the Fish River brew, the coffee, all jacked up. You were listening to John Mellencamp last week too. You got your blue jeans on today. You got him dressed down with a t-shirt and your cowboy boots. And I've got to say, I spent quite a bit of time out in the paddock working over the break and uh, I had Spotify going in my ears and I put on and searched John Mellencamp and I kid you not, I reckon there were two hours of hits Mm -hmm. back to back where I knew every song. Now Mm -hmm. I've been around a while, don't get me wrong. However... That guy's back catalogue is absolutely amazing. Yeah, um, it's brilliant, isn't it? He's uh, he's a bit of a he's a bit of a legend, and as we alluded to at the end of last week's show, he um, he lives what he writes too, which is something that I've always admired about his songwriting. And it's all- Mojo Radio Show. So our guest this week, and this this is a this I think is a very topical topic. Topical where topic. We are in, no, it is. It, it just seems like the perfect topic right now because the number of people who make a time for a call or time for an appointment and then have to change it because they're busy or something else has come up or they're just it's just a bad week for me. This week is crazy, and. I don't know, it just seems right now it's even harder to manage our day to get everything that we want to get done, done the way we want it done. Are you alluding to me? I was guilty of that earlier this week. Well, no, <laughs> well yes, but it's, that's, not, that's, that's not my point. I mean, even John Mellencamp did a song called um, Save Some Time and the premise of the, of the song was Save Some Time for Yourself and this week's guest is Cyril Poupillon, which is French for Poupillon, And he wrote a book called Work Smarter, Live Better. And this is a book that a listener wrote to me about and said, you should get it. Can you get this guy on the show? And we have. Now, Cyril essentially helps people change their work habits, uh, take control of their day to improve performance and productivity, which is bang in line with exactly what our show is all about. Work Smarter, Live Better was in the top 10 books, business books here in Australia. He's a contributor to lots of business magazines and TV shows and the like. But what 
I have liked about Cyril is he gives us practical tips and tools of things we can do or change to take control of our day and ultimately get the mojo back in every aspect of our world. So with that said, Cyril, welcome to the Mojo Radio Show, mate. Thank you very much. Now, when people meet you, Cyril, and they ask you what you do, how do you like to reply? The short answer to this is, first, who do I help? And so who are the people that I think you can help? Um, my clients are normally leaders, managers uh, from in business. Um, so people working, they normally have a team, uh, either small or large team. They normally are high performers. So people are doing pretty well, but they completely swap. And um, they swap with email, they swap with tasks, they swap with things to do, they swap with meeting. And the default, and their default is working harder and harder, working longer and longer hours. Um, and these is typically the people that I work with. There'd be people who've been working for 40 years and they would think they're pretty good at it. What... What is it that we need to learn the most? Like right now, what are you finding is the key thing that if we were going to be taught to work more effectively, what's the, what's the most important thing you would teach somebody now? So uh, first of all, I'll answer by responding to your observation and then by responding to what other thing that, 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 that jumped the most. Um, a lot of people have been taught a qualification. But when I, talk, when I say most people have been taught how to work, I'm talking about those work habits, those little things that I've described. And you would be surprised the amount of, I mean, executives, leaders, managers, people who've got 20, 30, 40 years experience, who at the end of the process, the journey, when we work with them, said to me, Cyril, why the hell has no one showed that to me before? Those simple things. Um, in the area of productivity, of efficiency, of effectiveness. There are a few master. Uh, one of them is Stephen Covey. So you might have heard about the great book called The Seven Habits of Highly Effective People. And the other one is Peter Drucker. Um, he, Peter, if you go to a library and you look for Peter Drucker, there's a stack of book about leadership, about management, about him. They both had the same observation. The, the, the way Peter Drucker put it was probably the most interesting. He said, in 45 years as a consultant, I have never met an executive who was born effective. All the effective one had to learn it and to practice it until it became a habit. So I'm not saying that everyone doesn't know how to work. There are some people who've learned it. What I'm saying is you don't learn that at school and you need to learn it and practice it until it becomes a habit. So that's the first part, which is, and it's really surprising when you have someone who's quite successful, but their way of um, success for a lot of people is working harder and harder and harder, and that's not sustainable. One of the the things that um, come the most, um, I always say the first one that comes to my mind straight away is managing this volume. The volume of email is a great example. Uh, As I mentioned, people are receiving one, two, three hundred emails per day. And you think 20 years ago, on average, people would be receiving five, 10 emails per day. And so the jump in 20 years is dramatic. Um, People are now spending between two and three hours a day based on email. So it has a real impact. And if you don't know how to manage it really well, you're going to drown. So email management is a very simple example. Um, The other one that I come to my mind straight away is is this big dichotomy between reactiveness and proactiveness. Uh, it's so easy to be reacting, to react to all the email you're receiving, to react to all the things you've been asked to do, and you're just reacting to all the crisis of the day, where a lot of people are struggling to say, well, I'm just being reactive all day, but I'm not spending any time on the thing that really matters. How do I prioritize? How do I spend my time on the thing that really matter? The, the thing, Gary, that people tell me very often is, I know what I'm supposed to do. I know my strategy. I know what are the things that I should be doing. But, but look at the number of email, but look at the number of meeting, but look at the number of crisis, but look at the number of blah, 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 blah. How do I deal with this? And this is this constant battle um, which you need to help people in. It's funny though, Cyril, because I hear you say that, and I agree with you. Like I'm, I'm agreeing with everything you're saying. I just find it fascinating, and so must you. I mean, this must be the good part for you because you get work from it. But why is it that these leaders and managers are surrounded by 
apps and technologies and training and methodology and information on all designed to make us more productive and efficient. I mean, there is no business manual or trained. Everything you talk about is all about being more productive, being more efficient, improve, improving your performance. Yet, I hear so many people, to your point, the word you used was drowning. They're just drowning in it and they feel flat and grey and beige and they just struggle through the day. Why Why do we need more help with this? What's missing? Look, I was not there. You know, I was not working in the business world 50 years ago, 100 years ago and so on. I think this 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 has a skill that has always been important. So, and you know that a lot of people have they've been taught those skills, whether it's now, whether it's twenty years ago, whether it's fifty years ago, whether it was hundred years ago. So, I think the skills are the same. The thing that has changed recently is everything has accelerated, except our brain capacity. Everything has accelerated. I mean, if you think about um, snail mail, as we call it now. You used to send uh, to write a letter to someone. It would take time to write it. Then you have to post it or have to go to the person. And then uh, it'll take a week to get there. And then they read it and they respond. it take another week to get back. Then we moved to fax and things started accelerated. And now with email, you receive an email. And if you don't respond within 10 minutes, you might have a phone call and say, Gary, I sent you this email. Why have you responded? So... The technology, which is supposed to be make us more productive, everything has accelerated. But our, I don't think our brain capacity, I don't think our speed of processing thing has changed for the slightest in the last 20 years. We're the same human being. And so I think that those principles have always been important, have always been critical, whether it was now, 20 years ago, 200 years ago. But I think everything has accelerated and email had a big impact on this. And we now expect, I mean, it's um, an example of a client I was with yesterday and they were whinging, we're talking about uh, meetings and they're whinging because very often now they go to a meeting and will receive the information of the meeting three minutes before the meeting. I mean, how can you have an effective meeting if you're supposed to digest information in three minutes or are you going to start wasting the first one? So everything is so quick now, but we don't have the brain to read and digest and to think and prepare this meeting in three minutes. But the technology allows us to send it three minutes before. I think that's a one of the a really big problem that I see. Let's, let's give some people some solutions, Cyril, because I agree with you. Let's start with email. You've mentioned that a couple of times already on the show. Give me, give me a tip, a tool, a strategy to help me deal with email. Okay. So first, to, to deal with an e- a problem, you need to recognize what's the problem. For me, the challenge that I see with email is we are bombarded. As I mentioned, the volume is an, a, 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 an issue. The second issue that I see is, is completely endless. It's an endless flow. It doesn't stop when you sleep. It doesn't stop on weekend. It doesn't stop on leave. Um, although now some company are starting to put some rules in place, now there's a few company that's starting to put some rule that when you go on leave, the server cut you off automatically from email, which I think is fantastic, but they're only the exception at the moment. And unfortunately, email now follows us everywhere. We used to be you know, at work and that's it. Now you've got your sm- lovely mobile phone, your iPhone uh, or whatever, or Samsung, whatever tool you're using, which means that you have access to this 24-7. And when I say 24 Four seven. Uh, some people check email really late in the evening and first thing when they wake up in the morning. So I think there's a real challenge that has been created with recently with this one. I think there's a mind shift that everyone needs to adopt. So I'm starting to be in solution mode here. I ask my client a very simple question. Take the first 10 email that you have in your inbox. And you honestly answer this question. Out of those 10 email, how many will truly have an impact long term on your performance? So you look at your first 10 email and you ask yourself, out of those 10 email, how many will truly have an impact long term on my performance? Gary, I've asked this question to many people. My average answer is one. <laughs> Sometimes it's zero point something. <laughs> so my, this is fascinating. We are yeah. completely obsessed 
with, with this inbox and this email, but if we sit down in a realistic way, 90% of that will have no impact long-term on our performance. Why are we so obsessed with this? So that's the mind shift behind that. So then my solution for email, and I, as I mentioned, I now since the, the, the success of my book six, six years ago, you know, Work Smarterly Better, I'm now asked to work with, uh, me and my team actually, it's not only me, me and my team, we're working with companies around the world. And so we're working with leaders who are bombarded with email. The only way that I found it to really work with them to be in control and not stress with email are a very simple first f- a suggestion. The first one is batch. Do not check your email constantly. Have two email processing time per day. That's it. You put in your diary, two email processing time. Sometimes I like to come back to the old analogy. Let's say that rather than receiving 150 email per day, Gary, you receive 150 letters per day. But imagine that the postman Deliver them to you one by one. Come at 7 o'clock in the morning and say, hey, Gary, I've got a letter for you. And then come back at 7.05, say, Gary, nice to see you again. I've got another letter for you. And then at 7.10, Gary, long time no see. I've got a lot letter for you. You'll shoot the guy after a while. <laughs> this is what we do all the time too with email. So my first advice is you batch email. You have two email processing time per day. It doesn't mean you do not allow yourself any other time to check email. What it means is there are time where you ban email. If you say I'm going to be working on a document for half an hour, this is a no email go zone. This is a zone where for half an hour you are 100% focused. So that's my first suggestion. Batch your email. And I'll go even further. Don't do it first thing in the morning. A few years ago, people would say to me, Cyril, the first thing I do when I come to the office is my email. It has changed, Gary. Now, people say to me, the first thing I do when I wake up is my email. I think I'm being a loss because I was watching a TED talk uh, by uh, a lady, Maureen McGrath, who's uh, um, a Canadian, but she's a specialist in the US about love, relationships, sex, and so on. And she shared two figures that really struck me. She shared 35% and 10%. 35%, the first thing that the people do, 35% of people, the first thing they do after making love is jumping on their mobile phone. Oh, God. Oh, God. 10%, Gary. 10% of people check during. Oh, no. <laughs> no, this is impossible. I mean, I'm French, and I think from a French background, although I'm half French and Australian, <laughs> you can't do this. That's, that's impossible. So do not check your email first thing in the morning. Why? If we agree that 90% of the email is crap and it doesn't warrant your time, why do you want to spend the best time of your day when your brain is fresh or when you should be with your kids on something which is 90% crap? That's my first suggestion is that. My second suggestion is, when it's your email processing time, you are a decision machine. And whenever you touch an email, you need to ask yourself a very simple question. Less than five minutes, more than five minutes. Less than five minutes, do it now. More than five minutes, find a time in your diary and calendarize it. That's it. Finish. No more. You're actually not doing email. You're just processing email. First email decision, second email decision, third email I, I've been, fourth email I moved to somewhere, fifth email I'm going to move to my calendar and block a time to do it. Bing, 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 bing. That's all. They're my two simplest suggestions for email. It would be fair to say with the people you work with, Cyril, that email is a big distraction and a, a necessary evil in some respects. And I suspect the other thing would be meetings. When you are working with your clients, what are your suggestions for ensuring that people have effective and efficient meetings? Because the one thing I hear a lot is how much time is wasted in meetings. What's your advice? Um, Great question. Um, You're uh, again, let's recognize the problem. I think the, the first big problem of meeting is I call that high investment, low return. We spend a lot of time in meetings. Managers spend nearly 50% of their time in meetings. Now, I'm not saying meetings are good or bad. I'm saying if we spend so much time, we need to make sure that the time that we spend 
is worth it. Harvard Business Review in 2014 published an interesting survey and research on meeting. And what they show, and they interviewed a lot of managers, and more uh, managers interviewed said that more than half of the meeting they attended were rated ineffective or highly ineffective. More than half of the meeting they attended were rated ineffective or highly ineffective. Um, the, the other thing is for a lot of people, uh, they say, look, uh, you know, uh, I feel so fragmented because my day is full of meeting. I'm back to back. Um, I can't really work on something because finding an hour, two hours in my day, whether having a lot of man, the people I work with, I'm just like, I'm meeting galore. I remember a, uh, one of the, the, the most senior manager of one of the biggest financial companies in Australia. And um, we're, we're talking about coaching him and his team. And I asked him, so why? Why do you want personally to be coached? And he said something to me that really struck me. He took his iPhone and he showed me his calendar. And his calendar was back-to-back meeting. There was even sometimes two or three meetings at the same time. And I will never forget what he said to me. He said to me, Cyril, when am I supposed to do my job? And it was like this. We spend our life in meeting and so we feel so fragmented behind that and we don't have the time. So, Again, I'm going to talk about a mind shift first and then about solution. The mind shift is simple. Gary, if I come to you and I say, Gary, can you give me $500? What would you say to me, Gary? Uh, what are you going to use it for? Exactly. And you're being very kind. <laughs> you say, well, why? What are you going to use for? Well, what's the reason for this? It is so easy to give our time away. So easy to accept meeting. The mind shift here is value your time more than your money. Because those 500 dollars you give away, even if you lose them, Gary, you can earn another $500. Every day that you waste, every hour that you waste, they're gone forever. And so the mind shift here is value your time, and especially the time you give away in meetings, as much, if not more, than your money. So simple suggestion. I'm going to make the things that I've that, that so that's more than mind shift. Simple suggestion. Um, one is put some simple rule with the people. So it's more than mind shift, and I, it's always the mind shift which is more important. But asking some suggestion, put some simple rule with the people that you're working with. For example, before accepting a meeting. You need to request three things, and I call it a 3P. The purpose, which is what's the end of the meeting, the process, which is what are the agenda, the bullet points, and the prep. I think it's absolutely fair, and a lot of teams that I coach, they now put that as a rule that no meeting within the team will be accepted if we don't have the 3P. So you have a real triage. You know, it's like when you go to a hospital, when you go to a hospital, the emergency, they do a triage. And so your triage is rather than accepting yes, a meeting, you need to triage the meeting. You need to triage by saying, understanding the three P, what's the purpose, what's the process, slash the agenda, and what's the prep required. You need to have a triage in terms of impact. Is that worth investing an hour and a half of your time? Now, I know it's not always easy to say no, but... You find it. You didn't say yes to this five hundred dollars. Yes. Why do we say yes to our time? <laughs> yeah. um, another big advice that I have is fight the one-hour default. What do I mean by fight the one-hour default? Such a simple trick that can make such a difference. Most of the meeting, you know, a lot of meetings that I see, not most, but a lot of meetings that I see are either an hour, sometimes half an hour, but the one hour is the big one. Ban the one hour meeting. Have 45 minutes meeting or 50 minutes meeting. Ban the 30 hours. Have 20 minutes meeting. I can guarantee all the one hour meeting that you have can be done in 45. And then it gives you 15 minutes to breathe, to reflect on the meeting, to do a little bit something else before preparing to the next one. That's a very simple thing that can give you back time straight away. Um, there are some, and the other thing I might suggest in meeting, once you've done the filter, once you started reducing the amount of time that you need to spend, is I highly suggest that you create templates. 
So what do I mean by templates? I have uh, meetings which are very regular internally, and I have client meetings which are quite the same one. So for example, internally, I have a meeting with um, one of my staff members, Josh, and we have uh, every week we have a meeting to, to check the progress that he's making on his priority. We call that the Big Rock Weekly. Well, we have a template. We have a template for how we're going to conduct the meeting, and the meeting always follow this simple structure. Um, I have meeting with my clients, so when I have discussion with my client to discuss and explore if and how we might be able to help, I have a template, and I follow a very simple question. It makes my prep super quick, and it makes the meeting super effective. That's another suggestion. What's the most alarming trend you're seeing in leadership now, Cyril, with your travels, people you're working with, your observations, if there was one thing that alarms you about the leadership in business today and the operation of a leader in their role, what would it be? The first one that comes to my mind straight away, I'm going to call that T3. And what I mean by T3 is time to think or lack of time to think. One of the biggest complaints, it's funny because a lot of people see top leaders as people in their ivory tower and, you know, doing the thinking and so on. I can tell you the reality is completely different. They're running like that chook. They are running, they're very fragmented. They're running from one thing to another one. And one of the biggest complaints I have from leaders is I have no time to think. I'm just being reactive. I'm just jumping from one crisis to another one. It's just a rut race rather than being a quality race. It's probably the thing that comes first to my mind. I've heard you talk about, I think you mentioned it at the start of the interview, the um, like a, an operating rhythm. What's what's a high performance operating rhythm for a leader in your mind? Yeah, I'm, I'm a big fan of operating rhythm. And again, I'll, I'll first talk about the why and I'll explain about what what is behind. Um I'm a big fan of rhythm and routine. Um, I love the, the quote from Aristotle. And, you know, when I was talking that these concepts are not new, they've been there for long. long. You know, Aristotle, that's not you know, yesterday. That was a while ago. Aristotle had this beautiful phrase, which is, you are what you repeatedly do. Excellence is not an act. It's a habit. You are what you repeatedly do. Excellent then is not an act but a habit. And I really believe that. I'm not an amazing husband because one day I decided to be wonderful with my wife, bring flowers and treat her well. Tell me the husband that I am on a daily basis and I'll tell you the kind of husband that I am. I'm not an amazing father because one day I decided to come home early and play with the kids and take them out and you know have a wonderful afternoon. Tell me the father that I'm on a daily basis and I'll tell you the kind of a husband than I am. I don't have an amazing health because one day I decided to exercise a lot and eat carefully a lot of vegetables and, and, and fruits one day. Tell me my eating habit on a daily basis and tell you the kind of health that I have and my exercise habit as well. So I really believe into building some routines and routine are important at a few levels. First, you need to have the right routine. And then when they become routine, you don't even think about it. They just become the routine behind that. So I'm a real big believer in those routine and operating rhythms that you have. So one other, the, the simple one that comes to my mind uh, behind that. One routine is make sure that you protect your personal time. I think it's really important. We always think, and so that might surprise you, when I work with a leadership team, the first thing I make them block is their personal time. Time for their family, time for their health, time for exercise, time for their friends, because that's pro- uh, the first thing they put out of the window. And on your deathbed, Gary, I know what moms are might be on my deathbed, but on your deathbed, if you ask, what was more important, the time with your wife, time with your kids, time with your friends, or time responding to email? It sounds stupid. No brainer. No brainer. But on a day-to-day basis, how many managers stay later in the office just to respond to those emails or finish the last document they need to finish or, 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 or? So it's a no-brainer when you ask the question the right way, but in reality... That's not what people are doing on a, on a day-to-day basis. So the, talking about habits and routine, the first routine I really make them put in place, I make them think about their personal routine, their family routine, their health routine, and we protect that in their diary. The second routine, I make them think about their long-term priority. 
So, all right, let's talk about what's going to make you, you and your business successful long term. What are the few priority which really going to have an impact long term? Let's protect some time every day for these, and I highly suggest it's in the morning. But Cyril, I can't because every morning is different. I said, fine, let's protect an hour and a half every day or two hours every day first thing in the morning. If we need to move it, we'll move it, but it's there. At least you try to protect it. Third, let's protect time for your emails, and we do this two batch. The logic here, Gary, is quite simple. Most people let everything get control of their diary, and then at the end of the day, they say, oh, shit, I had no time for my priority, I had no time for my family, I had no time for my health. And I'm saying, no, let's do the, and I do my email at 11 o'clock at night when I'm exhausted. And I say, well, no, let's do the opposite. Let's protect the time for the thing that really matter. And you say to Mr. Rest, you say, I still leave some time open, so I'm not going to block 100% of my diary. I might only block 50 or 60% of my diary. You still have 50 to 40% to play with, but you only have 40% to play with, not 100%. That's what I, well, that's the kind of very efficient and effective operating rhythm that I've seen created. Earlier, Cyril, you talked about one of the alarming trends you're seeing is leaders not having time to think. Part of it seems to be the inability of leaders to truly focus on one thing without distraction, to truly have one laser beam focus to sit within that issue, that problem, that opportunity for long periods of time and really ponder it. What's your advice? What what can you share that you've seen or worked with some of the leaders you've, you've spent time with? How do we develop a focus? Because we are distracted yeah, th- you've said thinking time is critically important. Is there tips or tools you've seen that you, with people you've worked with that have developed great focus? I think the first thing is like everything, Gary, is awareness. And then I'll talk about the tip. But I think, first of all, you need to be aware of the impact of being interrupted and being distracted. Um, there's a lot of work on high performers and a lot of work on high performance. But whenever you look, whether it's high performance In the business world, whether you look at high performance in the sport world, whether you look at high performance in the scientific world, wherever you have high performance, everywhere you look at high performance, one of the most important attributes of a high performer is focus. Everywhere. I'll give you something that really struck me. About a year and a half ago, the New York Times published a really interesting research. So basically, they took a group of people and asked those people to do a pretty hard task. And, and they asked those people to do this hard task in a quiet environment where they were quite focused. And um, they got some results, and they were measuring the rate of errors. And because it was a hard task, there was a rate of errors of what people are doing. And then they asked those people to do exactly the same task. So they're doing this search with two kind of group, group in a quiet environment. And the other group was still in a quiet environment, but they introduced in the middle of the task a two to three second interruptions. I'm not talking about 20 seconds. I'm not talking about two minutes. I'm talking, Gary, about two to three second interruption. When people were interrupted two to three seconds, so two to three seconds, what it is, it is being you have an email or you have a, a, a WhatsApp that arrives or you have a notification on your mobile phone, you, ch- you check, you look, and you put down. That's two to three seconds, no more than that. So you haven't even responded. You have, your eyes have just glanced on your mobile phone to check it. Whenever people were exposed to this two to three second interruption, it doubled the rate of errors of what they were doing. So my answer, Gary, the first thing is you need to understand how bad it is. Two things will happen when you let yourself be interrupted. First, you diminish the quality of what you're doing. And second, it takes you much more time to do what you're doing by a ratio of one to three. It is just amazing. So my first answer to you, Gary, is people need to be aware of that. They need to know the danger of being interrupted. Now, it doesn't mean that all your life you need to be only in focus, but it needs to be a rule which is important, not only in the business life, but I apply the same rule in my personal life. When I'm with my kids, I want to be 100% there. My kids know really well when my body is here, but my brain is still in the office. They know. My wife, she knows really well. We go to a dinner together, 
And she's like, what's bothering you? She knows that half of my brain is still on something else. I really want to make sure that whenever I do something, so when I'm with you now, I'm 100% with you. When I'm with my wife, I'm 100% with her. When I'm with my clients, I'm 100% with them. I really want to be focused and being 100%. So one other simple suggestion around this. My first one, to develop deep focus. Um, and I love, I think, I think you, you mentioned uh, in one of the past discussions that you had Carl Newport and his uh, great book. Um, fascinating, really interesting, the research that Carl, Carl has done on the creating deep focus. So important. So my first suggestion is book meeting with yourself. It sounds stupid, but block in your diary and say, I'm going to spend, and be realistic, don't block three hours. You probably can't concentrate for three hours. Um, Carl talk about at the beginning, you might not want to block half an hour or 45 minutes, and you increase it as you improve your focus, a bit like a muscle. But make an agreement with yourself and say, during that time, I'm going to be focused. During that time, set the scene. What I mean by set the scene is make it realistic. Switch off your mobile phone. Close your outlook. Hide yourself. If you can't work in your workplace because you've got to be interrupted, well, go to a coffee shop. Go to another room where no one knows you. Work from home. But try to set the scene so you really can focus. Um, there's another trick which is called Pomodoro. Pomodoro was invented by an Italian. Pomodoro means um, tomato. And this Italian had this little tomato which was a clock. You know this little clock that we have in our kitchen? <laughs> is that where that's it came from? Had. Yeah, that's where it came from. Pomodoro <laughs> means tomato. And he had, it was basically his little clock that to boil the egg. And so the technique became... You put your little clock, your timer for 25 minutes, and for 25 minutes, you get absorbed. And you know when you get absorbed, you completely lose track of time. And then when the clock rings, you have five minutes to just breathe, to do something else, just get a bit of walking, um, just get away from technology, get your fresh, and then come back, 25 minutes and five. So set the time, and for this time, you do not allow yourself to check any technology, you just focus on one thing. And then after that, have some breathing time. Stretch your leg, go and have a little walk, and so on and so on. That's some simple recommendation to have. But the main one is understand the danger behind that. What I love is speaking with learned people who have an obsession with learning. And it's something Dr. Jason Silk, who's the sports performance coach for the St. Louis Cardinals, said to us on the show. He wrote 10 Minute Toughness. And when I said, What's the attribute? that you find most prevalent with successful people. And he said they're obsessed with learning. And you, you seem to be that sort of guy, Cyril. And what I'm curious about is how, how do you record or store ideas that you read or hear? What's your process for taking in content, finding the gold, and then storing it so that you remember it and can access it to share with your clients? So first of all, I 100% agree with that. For me, um, it is it's so important. Uh, I, I found that there's so many fascinating things, value things. I mean, I love what you have done where, uh, you know, and get, tell me if I'm wrong, Gary, but you're offering a great service to everyone with some great learning and great content. But also, you probably do that when your motivation is for you. You're learning constantly and you're getting exposed to those great ideas, which yeah, is amazing. Yeah. Mm. Amazing. It's almost like you have found a trick to have a lot of great thinking coming to you and then you know, doing a session for you for, a, for an hour for free, which is amazing. <laughs> and, I, mean, I, mean, I, I, I think I've got my hat off. It's really fantastic. That's great. We call it, we call uh, it therapy, Cyril. <laughs> <laughs> an hour of therapy, no, Robert. <laughs> That's great. I love it. Um, and I mean, I have, in my personal life, I have six values. And in my business, I have three big ones that I've put in front and in both my personal and my business, continuous improvement, thirst of learning is a really, really important one. And this, this logic that uh, when you get into this, uh, how many books have I read? How many TED Talks have I watched? Uh, I constantly try to uh, go and put myself into other training and, for, and, and develop myself. I have a few mentors that challenge me all the time. And so it's this, it's amazing the amount of wealth and knowledge that is out there that is so easy accessible and very cheap 
to be honest with you. So I agree with you, it's really, really important. So personally, how do I do this first? Um, I have this logic, which is morning is for learning, um, evening is for calming down. What do that mean? I wake up every morning at 5.45 and, uh, and I dedicate, so I meditate and I dedicate 45 minutes to learn every morning. Every single morning, um, unless I go to bed really late and I decide that I sleep a little more. But if not, my routine is 6.45 and out of, uh, in my morning routine, I've got about 40, 45 minutes to read or to learn or to watch or something. I want to learn. So it could be a book, it could be a TED talk, it could be a, an online lecture. I just want to learn and absorb. And it's funny because the amount of thing I want to learn is always much bigger than the time I have available. So I'm never short of things to learn. Never, ever, ever, ever. I wish I had three times this amount of time. And I'm sure I still would be frustrated because so much. Now, how I do that, and in the evening, I, um, I read. I'm, I'm French and I love comics. So in the evening, I would either read a comic or read a, um, a novel. And it's just to calm down, no technology, just to put my... I my, calm my rhythm and go to sleep like a baby. But in the morning is for, re, for learning. Um, when I read, I read to learning and to apply. So my logic is, you say, what do I do with this? Is to say, I always ask my question. The question is, say, how can I use either for me, for my clients, for my family? What can I do with this? So it's learning to improve. So I learn, and when I do this, I have a pen, I have a fluo, I have a, I straight away a pen and paper, and I sketch ideas straight away. So oh, you love that, um, and it's always the, the word in the back of my mind is yes and but. Uh, no but. So yes and is, yes and I can even push it and adapt to me. No, I disagree with that, but actually it made me think about something and always trying to think about how can I take ideas and apply them. So I could read something about health. Okay, what do I'm going to do with this? Is it what I'm going to change tomorrow? I can read something about exercise, what I'm going to do. I can read about something about happiness and what does that mean? Concretely, I'm going to apply it. So this constant obsession to say, let's go beyond the reading. Let's talk about application. Now, all the books that I've read, for example, I don't give them, you know, sometimes people say, oh, can you give me this book? I know you've read it. And I say, no, no, because it's full of annotations, things that I come back and so on. So I record everything um, on what I do. When I watch a video, I have the video on one side and a, a Word document on the other side and I type ideas. So I just record all that. But I think for me, the most important thing is constantly thinking how can I apply that? And I spend some time during the week say, I've read that, how I'm going to apply it. So it's this practical that is so important for me. Do you journal? I do a um, daily journal in the evening. So one of my routine going to bed um, before actually reading either my novel or my comics is I write a journal where I write two things in my journal. Well, actually three things, to be honest with you. One is... Uh, I have a great, it's a grateful journal. So every evening I finish with three things I'm very grateful for, for my day. Um, so very, it could be very simple things. So I have my grateful journal. One is I have a few indicators about my health, about my routine that I tick. So it's a tick, no tick. Have I been good in this one? And one, it is a journal about ideas that I have in the back of my mind, you know, anything that struck me today, anything that I want. So I just capture ideas and say, ah, oh, I I got that in the back of my mind and just write a few things and it's just leave me to sleep on it. So it's just more a journal about things that I've observed, things that I'm, it could be things that I really enjoy or it could be things that frustrate me and I just want to write a few things in the back of my mind and just put them on paper and just if I had to capture them, help my brain to crystallize on this. That's the three things I do in the evening. The, the question that's more important than do you journal is which comics do you read? <laughs> Oh, there is a, the, the French comic is a big industry. Mm. Uh, you know, there is, for those who know the French comic, you know, it, when I was a kid, it was, of course, the Tintin, the Lucky Luke, and so on. Now, it's such a huge industry. Uh, I don't know, Enki Bilal, I don't know, uh, um, Lago Winch, I don't know. I mean, it's, uh, there's so many different ones. And I have the luxury of going back to France probably once or twice a, a year. And uh, I always make sure I bring back one or two boxes of comics uh, for, uh, for to complement our collection. So that's a passion yeah. of mine. The Luger Winch has always been one of our favourites, Robert, hasn't it? it? Indeed. And if I can make a suggestion, there's there's an, a classic Australian one, actually a New Zealand one, called Foot Rot Flats, uh, which was authored by... How do you call it? Foot Rot Flats, um, which was authored by a guy called Murray Ball, who unfortunately passed away 
a year or two ago now, but you can still find his stuff if you if you want something that's a, probably a little left of centre of what you're actually currently reading, but very Australian stress slash uh, New Zealander. Uh, I can highly recommend that. I'm on it straight away after our meeting. You, you bet. Yeah, I'd <laughs> well, right, be interested in your feedback. <laughs> now let's let's talk about a priority. Is time management our biggest priority? Or is life management our biggest priority? Where do those two things sit in your mind? Time management is only a tool or a process. The priority, people sometimes ask me about what I do. And you started, and there might be you know, a, way that, a really good way to conclude on this one. Uh, you started asking when people ask me what I do. To be really honest, I have sometimes people from big companies that come to me and they, they've, they've seen what we've done with other team and they say, oh, it's real. are you and your guys about, you know, inbox and cleaning the desk and clearing the, you know, the soft file and organizing your calendar and organizing your priorities and so on? And I said, no. And they're always very surprised. They say, yes, we are in a way, but this, that's just tools. My, my real passion, Gary, is life. If you have, you know, sometimes you're trying to think about what are the words, what I'm, if there's a word that really defines what your passion is, what you're about. For me, it's two words. It's moment matters. They're the two words that really, for me, it's about, it's not about quantity, to be honest with you. It's not about the number of email you're doing, the number of meetings you're doing. It's not even about the number of years you're going to be living. It's about making sure that each moment that you live really matter, that you live with full intensity. Um, I don't know how long I'm going to be on this earth. Worse than this, Gary, I don't know how long my kids are going to be here. Something could happen to them. Unfortunately, and the worst thing that can happen to someone is to lose a close one like your wife or your kids. But it can happen. Let's not be. That, the thing that you can't control everything. The only thing I can control is to make sure that every moment that I live is a moment that really matters, that is worth living. Um, I have two big mantras in the back of my mind. Um, live as if it was your last day. So I live my life as if today was going to be my last day. It doesn't mean I'm going to go crazy, but I live with full intensity, with love, with caring, with you know, a lot of attention to the people I love. And the other mantra that I have in the back of my mind, I read once this, this beautiful mantra that I love, which is, life is not measured by the number of breaths we take, but by the moment that take our breaths away. I love that. And for me, if you really ask me what I'm about, if I have to summarize by four or five words, what I'm really, my real passion is transforming life and the how by changing your work habits. But the important thing is not work habits. The important thing is transforming life. Moments matter. So you ask me what's important. Is it about life management? Is it about time management? I'll say it's not life management, it's not time management, it's life. That's what's important. So if we are to wrap this up, tell me the most powerful productivity work habit that Cyril has in your day that allows you the time to create your own moments in life. I'm going to say, there's two big ones that come to my mind. One is weekly plan and one is routine. They're the two ones that come straight in my mind. Let me explain both. And they're quite linked. Every quarter, I ask myself this simple question. What are the, what are the two or three things, the two or three priorities that if I did really well would have the biggest impact long term? So what are the two or three things, not five, not ten, the two or three things, two or three priority, then if I did really, really well this quarter, so I fixed a quarter, would have a huge impact long term. And I choose two or three business priority, and I choose two or three personal priority. That's fairly easy. 
And when I do that with my clients, most of the time, so there's a process doing that, then we do a document that I call the compass plan behind that. There's quite a few things behind that, but the question itself, most people know straight away. The answer of the wiki plan is because such an important routine. Every week, I spend an hour to an hour and a half. I do that by fortnight now. I used to buy a link, but now I do a fortnightly plan, but it doesn't matter whether it's a weekly plan or a fortnightly plan. We'll call it a weekly plan because a lot of my clients are just are doing it on a weekly basis. Every week you sit down, and so I, for me every fortnight I sit down and I take each of my priority and I brainstorm them. And my question is, over the next week, over the next two weeks, what do you need to do to advance those? Simple things. It's never complex. So I just brainstorm that, and then I move into my diary. And this has to be in my diary before anything else, and this has to be done before anything else. And this is probably the most important habit that you can get, which is on a quarterly basis being crystal clear of what really going to have an impact long term, and on a weekly basis making sure that you prioritize that and you plan that in your diary and on a daily basis that you do them. I call this habit actually the think quarterly, plan weekly, act daily. Super important in my view. When you were talking before about time and life and moments, it made me think of David Heinemir Hansen who started Basecamp, wrote Rework and his most recent work was Remote. And when I said to him, is there a stoic philosophy you live by? He said something by Seneca. He said, there is enough time if you spend it well. And this has been time well spent, mate. I love your, the passion for what you do. I love the tips and techniques and tools you bring to the table uh, thank you to Nick, who was someone who bought your book and was a fan of your work, who wrote to me and said, I'd love to have this guy on your show. And I said, I'm onto it. And you kindly gave us your time, mate. So thank you, Cyril. It's been great, mate. It's my absolute pleasure. And the reason, Gary, I wrote a book is because my ha- my aim is to help millions of people um, to have those moments that matters to millions of people to really transform their life. And that's why I've written this book, uh, Work Smarter, Live Better. And it was a big surprise for me, Gary. I never expected that it would go the way it go, that it became a bestseller. Um, that's why I'm really open about sharing all the things. I think life is about sharing. I think life is about caring. And uh, the more I can help and share, yes, I make a business out of it. That's, that's absolutely fine. But I'm really happy to share that. And I'm a very, very lucky man. Um, I love what I do. Monday morning are good, good time for me. I love every minute of my day. I love what I do. Um, and, I, and I feel very fortunate for this. So thank you so much for inviting me and giving you a chance to share with this. And I hope those simple principles can be of, you know, I always say to people, pick your gold nuggets. So I hope that that your listener will find out two or three gold nuggets that will be helpful for them. Oh, there's plenty of gold in there. <laughs> <laughs> French gold. French gold. Comic gold. Comic gold. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and the maybe French, sh- the uh, French gold or uh, l'or français, the yeah. French gold. Hey, listen, one last <laughs> question. And any plans to turn the book into a comic? Never thought about that. That'd be a good one. Never thought about that. Crazy ideas, guys. a really good Easy comic. I- there's the ideas, guy. Come on. <laughs> I like the idea. The Mojo Radio Show. Simmer down, you noisy, screaming thing. We should give a shout out to whoever suggested that interview because that was pure gold. Nick. We call Nick. him Nickos. Nick off, Nick. In fact, he, I think we actually sent this guy some Fish River Roast or some of our rocket fuel, which was our chili ah, sauce we did. Okay. And I think he goes by the handle of Blue Halifax 6, ah, I think. He's, he's actually him. an airline pilot. Okay, nice. Uh, yeah, and uh, Nick, we shall say no more. Uh, we call him Mav, Maverick. Um, <laughs> Yeah, you can be goose. <laughs> <laughs> great balls of fire. Anyway, Nick wrote to me. It is a great book. I did my research on Cyril. I did, I liked his stuff and I thought that was pretty valuable. Yeah, that was awesome. He was great. I got a page of notes out of that one. Hi, I'm Maria Gronberg. I'm a 
a climber. I climbed Mount Kilimanjaro four times and summited Mount Everest this year of May. Oh man, I'm struggling through the Mojo Show. The Mojo Radio Show. They're the only chords I can play on the guitar. <laughs> <laughs> oh, well, you were telling us you were playing bass on the intro. What's how's that work? Well, I did actually play bass, but I couldn't do it again because I did the boys just said, put your fingers here and hit this. That's all I did. Uh, now, question, pop quiz for you. Yeah. Hot shot coming out of the radio industry for too many years to recount. Mm. Favorite live gig of all time? Uh, it would be U2 ZTV live in Brisbane. Bang. So, get this. Science is now telling us that going to a gig can actually help you live longer and increase your well-being. Wow. There you go. Now, this is actual research that says that by going to live gigs, and they say once a fortnight, but let's just say for the sake of it, going to live gigs on a regular basis Mm. could have life expectancy up by nine years. Wow. Nine years over a lifetime. Wow. Due to the power of positively impacting well-being. And this is all research backed up by Mm. an associate lecturer at Goldsmiths University in the UK. Now, this was a bit of research that was funded by O2 Arena, who own a massive amount of arenas across London. So Mm. let's put that aside for one minute. But what they're saying is that just 20 minutes of gig going, and if you go fortnightly, increases your well-being, your feeling of well-being by 21%. Wow. Isn't that unreal? So I wonder what the difference, um, it probably doesn't say anywhere, but I wonder what the difference between live music and just recorded music is. Aha, I'm glad you asked, Sherlock. Let me me tell you. Did I point It says... And I'll put this article into the show notes so everybody can read it for themselves. They're not just thinking we're rabbiting on. But the article says, those looking for a quick fix, however, should not look to just listen to music in private. With over two thirds of Brits, hello to our friends in Britain. Hello. Surveyed saying experiencing live music makes them feel happier than simply listening to music at home. Showcasing that the shared experience which performs so strongly in the research is key to increasing well-being. Now, increasing well-being by 21% of just 20 minutes at a live gig, and they say that if you did yoga, it only increases your well-being by 10% and dog walking by 7%. It also means that if you go to a live gig, according to the research, your feeling of self-worth goes up by 25%. And your feeling of being close to others and embracing a crowd up 25%, whilst mental stimulation, think Zoo TV U2, mental stimulation increased an impressive 75%. So I reckon that's fascinating. Yeah. And I am currently working with a state theatre company and I wrote to them after seeing this article and said, I wonder what the data is on going to a wonderful theatre show like the State Theatre Company down in Adelaide, for example, or mm. to a comedy store. Like you go and see Joe Rogan at the comedy store in LA, mm. then does that have the same well-being? So this is live gigs. And, mm. of course, you're talking 50,000, 60,000 people or 2,000 people going nutsos. Big screen, the visuals, the sound system, the whole thing. Mm. I'd be interested in research that says, well, what's it do for a comedy show where it's pretty straight with a guy at a microphone doing his thing or girl? Uh, Or a theatre company, which I think would be fascinating, where you do have the mental stimulation, you do have the gags, you do have the beautiful props, the, the costumes. So anyway, my take on this is get out of the house grab a loved one, go and rock out somewhere and yeah. uh, live longer. Absolutely. Does it, I mean, is it accumulative? Because I reckon in my youth I would have put on a, you know another 20 years on my life. I was going to two gigs a night there at one stage. Yeah, but see, the problem is that you've, re- you've regressed now that you're sitting <laughs> on the couch watching YouTube clips in your jammies and yeah. your Divinals T-shirt, which is three sizes too yeah. small, drinking Dos Equis. Yeah. Uh, although, I don't know if it regresses or not. Although I am going to see the hippos at the Bridge Hotel in Balmain next week, so that will be good. I'm looking forward to that. Another blast from my... There you go. Increase your lifespan. Hey, I wonder though, just quickly, and I wonder whether this article mentions it, 
But the thing that occurs to me also about going to gigs is that you're up on your feet dancing, exercising. Surely that must help as well. It doesn't mention it, but I... Well, you'd have to be. I mm. mean, it's, they talk mm. about sitting being the new smoking. Mm. Uh, standing desk during the day, but you'd have to think of going to a gig. You're standing up probably an hour before the band comes on. You're rocking out for two hours. Or if you're watching Springsteen, the boss, four hours. Yes. <laughs> then you've got to get out of the place. There's a half an hour to three quarters an hour before That's you get right. to your car or the train. Yeah. Then you've got to stand up on the tube to get home. So yeah, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> one would think you're burning lots of calories. But there then again... The other problem is that whilst you're standing there, you do have a pie in one hand and a hot dog in the other. So That's right. I don't and know, a beer on saying, your feet. <laughs> <laughs> I want one of those hats on with the, with the, with the, with the two, two lagers, the two one straws. either side, of the, and yeah. a straw going into your mouth. Yeah, so, the, uh, the, the thirst aid hat, yes. Is that a world world thing or is that just an Australian oh, thing? Oh, that's a world thing. The, oh, the, no, that's I've seen it at the baseball. Yeah, the These Yankees guys love wearing it. the hats with the, with the tinnies on top. It's good. All right. Uh, to take us out, let's uh, let's go to O2 Arena in London. Great band that takes us back to our well, to, where, to for me almost to where it all started. My love for rock. Let's put on a bit more Deep Purple. What is the selection? Which is the French for selection? Uh, Black Knight. How about that? We're out. Black Knight.
Thank you. The Mojo Radio Show is produced and recorded in the studios of Voodoo Sound. For more tips and tools to get your mojo working, check us out on Facebook at The Mojo Radio Show or online at themojoradioshow.com. For more about Gary, see garybirtwhistle.com or to polish your next audio or video production, check out voodoosound.com.au and for the right voice, realtimecasting.com. Andrew Peters speaking. See you next time.